Thank you guys. Thank you everybody for joining this talk, um, Delta Merge Optimizations with Jodi Helpers. My name is Joydeep. I work as the head of data science at Zeotap. A little bit about Zeotap and what we do. So Zeotap has two products, two verticals, Zeotap CDP and Zeotap Data. Zeotap CDP helps you integrate, unify, segment, and orchestrate customer data for brands and uh, drive business outcome for your first party data. And Zeotap Data is your third party aggregated data with exclusive telco data partnerships, which is consented and GDPR compliant. Now, we have been using Delta Lake OSS at Zeotap for a long time now, almost two years. We have migrated close to 500 Spark pipelines to Delta Lake. And what we intend to present today here is some learning from our production scenarios, production use cases. So let's begin. So uh, the first thing is obviously it's about Delta Merge. We're going to look at a little bit about Delta Merge because um, the, the entire merge, you, you might already be aware of the basic operations, but then each step in the merge is a compute operation, is a processing step, and wherever we can go ahead and optimize would actually mean that the entire merge gets optimized, right? So uh, you might be already knowing that merge involves two scans on your data. The first one is an inner join where it tries to do a join between your source and your target delta table to find the matched files. And then there's an outer join which tries to take these selected files from your target delta table and then uh, do, a, do an outer join with the source and then write out your updates, delete, and inserts. So I'd like to do a little deeper dive into this. This is more like a detailed uh, you know, overview, a high level overview of what the Delta merge entails. So at a high level, I just want you to focus on the first point, which is your data skipping, and then the inner join part, and then there is a writing phase where you have the outer, outer join, okay? So uh, we'll talk step by step about this. I'll keep coming back to this slide so, so that we uh, you know, keep it as a reference. So first, let's talk about the data skipping part. So, okay, so a lot of optimizations that we target, we want to take uh, advantage of the data skipping. We, we want to do that because even before you join, the number of files that are pulled into memory, the number of files that become a candidate for the join, determines the amount of shuffle that happens, right? So data skipping is really these collecting these min max values and null counts on your columns and the total records per file. And then, uh, you know, the files are filtered from your delta table based on these metrics. And these are the files which will actually be passed into your shuffle, right? So if you can optimize at this level, uh, there is something to be gained here. And that's where Jody can help you. So, uh, so if you, if, if you're, a lot of optimizations happen at this level. So you might be doing a compaction or you might be doing, uh, you know, compaction for um, reducing the file sizes or Z order or liquid clustering, or you might be putting a min max range in your merge, merge condition, right? Now, all of this you're doing because you want that data skipping part. However, there is no clear visualization there. You have to actually run the Spark job to get whether your data skipping worked or not. What you really want is a dry run capability where your data doesn't get pulled into memory, yet you're able to see whether your compaction took effect or not. And that's where Jody can help you. We have this method, get num shuffle files, where you can run this method before and after you run the compaction. And you can actually see how many files became a candidate for data skipping, whether the files that you were intending are included or no more included. So this is really the implementation. You can just focus on the calling part of it. So you would just put in your merge condition here, like same way you put it in your merge, right? And if you just focus on the output there, you'll see that there is an overall result condition. This really tells you how many files are finally part of that um, you know, shuffle are finally part of the data skipping, how many files got picked because of data skipping. Okay, and it really kind of breaks it down for you. So you will see individually as well, uh, whether the equals part, how many files were skipped because of it, or how many files were skipped because of it, and so on and so forth. So go take a look at this uh, file, uh, this function. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about is uh, file statistics. A lot of operations that we do, or we want to do, is when we run the merge jobs, we want to give our config files, right? Now you need to have a hold on the fact that how the data is moving in your system. So if you use these methods, delta file size distribution, 
delta num records distribution. This can give you an overview of your data. Uh, this will give you the number of parquet files, the mean size of your files, mean num records, standard deviation, min max, and the 10th to 95th percentile. I'll show you an example for this. And if you see here, the partition here is really at a uh, you know, country level. And we are able to see the number of parquet files, the mean size of those parquet files. You want to also see whether your file sizes are consistent. So we want to see whether from the 10th percentile till the 95th percentile, your file sizes are consistent or not, because that would actually help you tune those configurations. I'm talking about the shuffle partitions here. When you know you, and, and believe me, this is programmatic access. You can build on top of this and you can go ahead and tune your, uh, you know, the underlying Spark jobs on your Delta Merge. So this is what this can unlock for you. And hold the thought on running Merge at partitions. I'm going to come back to that point. But before that, I'm, I would like to talk a little bit about the insert-only Merge. Previously, I was talking about the Merge with upserts. This is more about insert-only Merge. This is the Merge when you only have inserts. Okay, so Delta Lake optimizes this for you. If you see the file skipping, the data skipping part remains same. But there's no inner and outer join. There is a left anti-join where it tries to figure out your insert candidates. And once it has figured that out, it uh, does the inserts for you. And what it means is this is an opportunity for optimization. Okay. Uh, so the first optimization, if you have already figured out the insert candidates, what you can really do is you can have no merge at all. Okay. In our case, we had figured out the append candidates in the first place. So we didn't have a merge. But remember, this is a blind append. Delta Lake does not check uh, any kind of duplication for you if there are duplicates in your source data, and this would blindly append your Delta table. If, if that is the situation, if you don't know whether your data has duplicates or not, you're okay with going with you know, an insert-only merge, which is really uh, a when not matched case clause with only inserts, okay? And that will do the left anti-join, which I showed in the previous slide, but then you're in good stead because you know there will be no duplicates that will be appended. So this kind of helps you save on that extra join. And uh, it also means that your updates would have smaller joins. Okay. So now let's, let's move on to this topic. This is a very interesting topic. It's multi-cluster writes at partition level. Okay. And uh, there are some very good blogs on it. And uh, I'll just try to entail what it, what it has. And this really takes advantage of the concurrency uh, control in Delta Lake. So when I say concurrency, the strategy to optimize is run multiple merge jobs at partition level. Okay, so concurrency works on the principle that it assumes underlying that uh, the likelihood of working with exact same data or row would be very low, right? And what better? And the key idea is partition. What better than a partition? Partition is the boundary where rows do not overlap. So if you run multiple merge jobs, which are segregated at partition level, they can all run concurrently. And why is that important? Because the number one reason is speed of execution. When you have that production table running and you really need to get the data inside, a one, one large merge job can take a lot of time. Instead, you can break it up, you can split it into multiple concurrent merge, right? Concurrent merge joins. And another important um, point that I would like to underline is avoiding failures. So when you have a large merge job, if, if that merge job fails because of just one partition, it prevents all the data for all other parti partitions to be written into your Delta table. Now, if you have broken it up, you essentially just have to fine tune, you just have to tune that job, right? You just have to go ahead and fix that. Other partitions, other data is still there. So this is the uh, strategy there. And the code is also very simple. The only change I would just like you to focus on the highlighted part where you have the target country equal to the source country. Earlier, you would do like this. And now what you can simply do is target country equal to USA. So what I'm really trying to say is you can have multiple merge jobs, one, at, one for USA, one for Canada, one for India. And all of these are running concurrently and giving you that speed that you need, right? And Jory can help you here as well. So we have this method, uh, which is called get count metric SDF. Now, if you see, there is a problem that is going to happen once you start doing multiple concurrent merge jobs at a partition level. The problem is your, all your partitions are now growing at a differential rate. Some will have a lot of inserts, some will have a lot of uh, you know, appends, some will have a lot of upserts. How do you keep track of them? 
So this method works at a partition level. If you see here, for country USA, it lists down all the versions that, have, that are pertaining only to country USA, and it shows you whether, how many deletes, inserts, and updates have happened there, along with the source rows. So this gives you kind of a comprehensive view, a programmatic access, and you can build uh, you know, some API on top of it for uh, your operations, okay? So, and another thing that I also want to tell you, this, this is something that we found. You might be surprised at what this method can do. We run this method regularly on our production delta table. And this is an example that I really want to highlight. If you look at, I think you'll have to squint, but if you look at on the left-hand side, uh, version 71, 73, and 75, you will see it ran without an overlap. What I really mean is there is no delete, insert, or update that happened. You know, and yet this join happened. So when we went back and checked in the code, there is this merge delete operation that ran at a regular frequency. When we set up this job with high expectation in our uh, production table, um, we, there, there used to be a lot of deletes. The deletes dried up over a period of time. We didn't realize that. And then, you know, all this inner join happened for the merge and then created a new version just for a no operation, right? It's a no op. So the fix that we did was we uh, reduced, reduced its run frequency and merged this operation with other upserts. But the point here is, you're definitely going to, if you run this method on your production delta table, you are going to find some very interesting underlying patterns. And that's pr probably the takeaway. Another small point which I'd just like to ingest here is that of the deletion vectors. If you have a problem of very uh, minimum writes, one or two writes coming in your system, you might want to check out deletion vectors that can solve the problem of uh, write amplification. So you just might just want to check that out as well. Okay, finally. So there's a problem with multi-cluster writes and it has been very well highlighted by Denny in, in this blog, that is for S3. We have faced this in GCS though. So I'll, I'll try to uh, outline the problem that you'll face. Now, the prescription that I gave is run multiple concurrent merge jobs and uh, at a partition level. So, so there's no problem there. But if you see, I'm, I've pointed out two merge jobs here. Now, uh, merge job one and merge job two, both have read this version two, okay? So merge job one finishes first, and it writes out version three, which is your three dot JSON. Ideally, what should have happened is, merge job two should ideally have written your four dot JSON or version four. However, it instead writes version three or three dot JSON. This has to do with strong consistency guarantees on your object storage. The, the fact that when mod job two went to the whatever the object storage was in this case, asked them that, hey, can you tell me is there a version three available or not? The listing operation did not work properly for the object object storage and, and it was not able to list the three version three dot JSON. And so it went ahead and over overridden that, right? So it has nothing to do with your data really. Your data is working absolutely fine, your job is working absolutely fine. It's basically a problem with the object storage. And now with more and more new object storage coming into the picture, every day you'll find a new object storage getting listed on the Delta Lake uh, page, right? So you would want to go ahead and check out for this issue. And for that, a valuable resource is the Delta storage page, which I have listed there. Uh, what we found is we really missed a jar. We, um, we were missing a log store implementation. And it was also partially because we were using Delta 1.1 and uh, we, we, hence, we have moved all our flows to Delta 2.2. But the point remains that there is this issue that can crop up with the new object storages and you have to look out for that. And while we were doing all of this, we also uh, wrote some methods. There's a PR which is pending on uh, Jody. We wrote this method that can help you detect that. So you can go ahead, check out this PR. The really cool part about Jody is you don't need to import the jar. Just copy paste the code in your Spark shell. Just run it, it just works because it's uh, built on top of Delta Log, the Delta standalone API. So you can just copy paste it, relevant parts of it. The interpreter will give you some errors, just copy paste the code, run it, and it should work for you out of the box. You don't need to you know, import it. So this is about the multi-cluster write problem. Finally, okay, I have time. So finally, I'd like to talk a little bit, since we are into merge optimization, we cannot go without uh, low shuffle merge with or without the photon optimization. So you see, the, your normal merge uh, really processes your touched rows, touched files, and untouched rows and untouched files the similar way. So not untouched files, but the untouched rows in a file, right? What low shuffle merge does is it processes the unmodified rows in a different manner, okay? So it does not pass them into your shuffles. So it's worth 
checking it out. And I'll tell you a trick about this. It's not available on Delta OSS. However, what, what we do is, so uh, you can run both your Databricks runtime and your Delta OSS on the same Delta table. Uh, Databricks has enabled that, that you can point and fire. The trick that we do is, and you know, take it with a pinch of salt, may or may not work for you. When we have fewer records coming in for upsearch, say a 0.5% or a 1% of the total number of records, we use a lo low shuffle merge. You know, that saves on all the cost because uh, low, shuffle mer low shuffle merge can be costly at times, right? And then otherwise we use the Delta OSS merge. So this might be something that uh, you, know, you, you can check out and you can run for yourself. Finally, okay, so we have if you see we have covered uh, uh, portions on data skipping, optimizations on data skipping. We have covered optimizations on the inner join. The inner join, when you have a match by clause, has a right outer join. In that case, it does some sanity on that. You know, multiple source rows are matching in your um, uh, target row or not, and recording some statistics at that level. Then comes the writing phase where you have the outer join. Okay, and the outer join also changes it, it. It's not really an outer join. It can be a right outer, it can be a full outer, okay, based on what condition is there. And finally, a very important point is that of the change data capture, okay? So if you have enabled change data capture, it brings in a whole gamut of problems because although it's a very good feature, it's a shiny feature, but it does not come free. It comes at a cost, okay? And those costs add up to your merge costs, okay? So you have to be cognizant of that. So I'll talk a little bit about change data feed, finally. So tread carefully here. If you switch on change data feed, there are certain problems that you can face if you switch it on and switch it off, switch it, you know, if you enable, re disable, re-enable, those kind of stuff. So if you face those issues, uh, you might want to, you know, tread carefully there. Um, there's, a, there's a post here where, which will help you, again, there are Jody helpers here, which can help you read this data when you are continuously switching on, switching off. Now you might ask me, why do you want to do that even, switch on and switch off? So basically, once you are, once you have deployed these tables in your production, you can understand patterns of your data, right? There might be a huge, so CDF is me not meant for huge data, right? Because you cannot have your entire Delta table coming in as a CDF, right? The entire snapshot cannot be part of the CDF, or it can be, it can be a use case. Uh, but for, our, for us, it was not working. So we figured out that on a particular day of the week, there used to be huge CDFs coming in. So what we did was we switched it off for those particular days and switched it back on when, you know, on other days. And while doing this, there can be issues that you can face. It's very well delineated in, these, in this blog. You can go through that and uh, probably that will help, okay? So it, ki it kind of depends on your use case really and uh, what kind of control you want. So, you know, uh, tread carefully with CDF there. Finally, okay, I have time. So how you can contribute back. So I'd like to talk a little bit about this here. So uh, Python has been the poison of choice, I know, for Delta Lake, but there's a good thriving community of Scala developers as well. So show some Scala love, go ahead, check out the project. And, and that's also partially because we came from the Spark days where we we're using Spark on Scala. And um, so there's a whole bunch of other optimizations and user features that are available on Jodi. But um, you know, since I was covering Merch, I did not cover the other ones. Go check it out. There's also this project called Mac uh, in the repo by Mr. Paz. And uh, that's also a fabulous project on Python. And if this talk has been too fast for you, I have most of it already, you know, elucidated, elaborated on this blog. You can go slowly check it out. And I think a lot of it will make sense. And uh, a really good way to communicate uh, probably would be to get active on Slack on this Delta questions channel and check out the GitHub issues of Delta OSS and Jody. However, I would like to say that what we have been doing is whatever we requested on Delta Lake, Delta Lake couldn't provide us. We created all these, if you see Delta Lake has given you all the tools, operation metrics, you know, everything. All you need to do is create these user level features. And that's what we have been doing. We've been checking in into uh, Jodi. And that's how we build this, you know, uh, small set of utility functions. So please go ahead, check it out, and please contribute. And uh, finally, thank you to Matthew Powers and Brian Jacks Jules. They have been really supportive in letting us, uh, you know, reviewing our PRs and uh, explaining the methods and everything. So thank you to them. And from Zeotap and uh, Sai and Nirudh, Yathart and Varis, they have also been really helpful in testing out all these scenarios, some production scenarios, so documenting them and really testing it out well. So thank you to all of them. And yeah, thank you. I'm on time. <laughs>